In this episode, I'm going to once again risk the wrath of SpaceX fanboys by calling bullshit on Elon Musk's most ridiculous claim yet. Well, kind of hard to stack those up, but this one is pretty ridiculous. His claim that Super Heavy can be reused in an hour after being captured. Not only is this completely unnecessary given the massive fleet of starships that SpaceX plans to have in the future, it is also completely impractical and really, I would think a physicist would know, utterly impossible. So we're going to go ahead and cover exactly why reusing Super Heavy in an hour is impossible. And more importantly, we're going to discuss a few details about Flight 5 that makes me wonder as to whether or not Super Heavy can be reused at all. At least not in its current configuration and might need a lot of work before it can actually be used again, whether it's captured by chopsticks or not. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good morning and once again, welcome to this angry bulletin about Starship and my latest take on less popular viewpoints when it comes to Starship's reusability potential and how it's going to revolutionize spaceflight in the near future. Before I go any further though, I want to make two things very clear. Number one, I feel that Starship will eventually revolutionize spaceflight. It has amazing potential and one day it will make an enormous difference at the same time is that day going to come in the next few months or next year i have some serious doubts about that and we're going to cover some of the reasons why in this particular episode and by the way i'm going to be sharing a lot of information from my team i asked them to contribute their reasons as to why they think that reusing starship in an hour seems very impractical and indeed reusing super heavy at all at this point might be a difficult difficult thing to do based on what we've observed, capture or not, with the chopstick. So let's go ahead and get started with the descent and what we observed. As you can see here, there is a lot of heating going on during this descent. The engines aren't burning at this point. That is all friction creating that glowing effect at the bottom of the booster, which by the way has stopped now. That terminal velocity is achieved and now the engines fire. Obviously that heats things up, but still we have all of that glowing going on during the descent. And you can see that a lot more clearly in this particular picture. As a matter of fact, Whatever heating is going on, it has caused warping in the bell nozzles, something that Elon Musk himself has acknowledged, although he says the problem can be easily fixed, although he doesn't really explain how. Let's compare this to the Merlin engines and Falcon 9's landing. You can see none of the same kind of heating, none of the glowing, and really not a whole lot of fire either when these nine Merlin engines go. It's just very, very different in terms of the amount of heat that the respective boosters are experiencing during the landing process. A pretty dramatic difference, actually. So why is this the case? Well, one of my team members goes by the name of Aztec Lion. He had this to say. Last week got me looking at reasons for this issue when compared to Falcon 9's descent and return. One big difference here is that Merlin 1D engines are radiatively cooled. That is, there is no active cooling in the metallurgy of the bell nozzles, which are niobium based. Plus they're using RP-1 for fuel, which isn't gaseous. And on the other hand, the Raptor engines are, like almost all cryo-fueled engines, regeneratively cooled, which means Means that in this case, methane is being circulated inside the nozzles to help keep it cool, which only occurs, of course, while the engines are running. 
And so as the Super Heavy booster is descending without the engines running, or many of them, which means for most of the descent, the bell nozzles and thrust puck aren't able to cool themselves. This seems to be a bit of an intrinsic problem and not a quick fix that Elon is talking about, unless they're going to introduce some sort of inert cooling gas in or around the engines and thrust puck, which is something that could be done, but it could screw with the aerodynamics of the booster and also control authority of the fins trying to keep the stage pointed properly and in a controlled fashion on the way down. Plus, of course, anything like that is going to add to the weight of the booster, reducing the amount of payload that Starship can deliver even further. There's another difference as well, pointed out by another member of my team named Dystopian Prophet. He points out that Falcon 9 does a re-entry burn, which reduces peak heating, fighting fire with fire. And then Darth Rust, one of the primary members of my team who contributes a lot to this channel and also works a great deal with missiles with the U.S. military, he had this to say, quote, My thought is that the amount of heating in the skirt and on the thrust buck is much higher for Super Heavy because of a much larger area. Also, Falcon 9 has a better developed heat shield on the lower thrust structure, which I'm sure Super Heavy will have someday, but probably not soon. If they can control that better, then the radiative environment should be a lot less and have a corresponding reduction of the heat load on the Raptors. That will probably play out over time once SpaceX really gets out of the prototype phase and technical demonstrators, which is where they are now, and they're not going to get out of that phase for a while meaning that we're not going to have a totally mature and ready for action starship anytime really soon in spite of what anybody says, especially Elon Musk. But what does all of this have to do with reusability, especially reusability in an hour? Well, you're going to find out in just a moment. But first of all, let's talk about propellant loading times as we have observed them with the various flight tests that have taken place thus far. The booster load for IFT-1 was an hour and 39 minutes, and that has dropped down to 49 minutes and 50 seconds for IFT-5. That's a dramatic improvement. And then the shipload process was another hour and 22 minutes for IFT-1. That's dropped down to 40 minutes and 40 seconds for IFT-5. Very, very impressive improvement as well. And then you have the chill portion, which actually went up from IFT-1 from 16 minutes and 40 seconds to 19 minutes and 40 seconds. So a steady reduction overall. And who knows? Maybe you could get the entire process down to an hour. I think that is definitely within the realm of possibility, but there is certain physical limits to pumping that much cryogen. We'll make a general assumption. By the way, all of this is courtesy of Darth Rust and his much better knowledge when it comes to rockets than mine. So in any event, let's make a generous assumption and say that they can load the propellant in both stages in 30 to 40 minutes but there's another limitation of physics based on raptor chill down an arbitrary mass has a finite volume of heat to remove from it and there's a limit to how quickly that heat can be removed if it's chilled too quickly it risks damaging the raptor's internal components from a number of effects partially from material sensitivity to thermal shock producing mechanical damage but also from bending and deforming parts as they are cooled. We don't know what Raptor's tolerance for cool down is, but it seems around 15 to 20 minutes is what we're looking at for current operations. There's an unknown here in that chill down may only require 10 minutes or so to get the entire engine within one degree or so and the other five minutes are stabilizing it so there's no gradient at startup. From this, we can speculate that a reasonable reload rechill cycle is somewhere around the 40 minute point, with the current configuration 15 to 20 minutes being used for concurrent engine chill. That's with a stack that's starting at an ambient that's relatively minor temperature difference already. 
As we have seen very clearly in this video, for a Super Heavy that's been caught and is still carrying a lot of temperature from re-entry heating, there are some additional concerns. The one sample we have showed the engine skirt glowing in several sources of video, as we've already talked about. It's unclear if the glow was from a skirt fire alone or that was heated material my opinion, it's heated material because it was glowing when the booster was still way off the ground. It's unknown what future changes SpaceX is going to introduce to address re-entry heating and what that cool down time will look like, but the engine bay and material of Starship has some kind of finite mass to it and it will take at least some time for it to cool down before it can be reloaded with cryogenic fluids for launch without risking thermal damage. That length of time takes more than 20 minutes or so, and I think that is an extremely generous estimate that it would only take 20 minutes for it to cool down sufficiently, then relaunch within one hour is not obtainable without some other design changes that we haven't seen yet, and perhaps the introduction of a yet-to-be-discussed pad cooling mechanism to reduce the residual re-entry heat in the booster. Again, I ask the question, why would all of this be necessary anyway? We don't need this kind of cadence from Super Heavy or from Starship anytime in the near future. Starship could launch once a week and still more than deliver all the low Earth orbit payload that we're ever going to require. And this is why Darth Rust makes the following point. More broadly, Elon's claim of relaunch within one hour or words to that effect strikes me as a desired design goal rather than a serious operating concept that we'll ever see normalized when Starship enters routine service. Elon has a track record of speaking in design goals rather than actual operating concepts, and it appears to me that the space fans, as much as I love them, of giving Elon's comments a lot more weight than they have really earned. I rate SpaceX very highly as a technical organization. Near the top of the list, along with venerated institutions like the Skunk Works and the Bell Laboratories of old, acumen and skills bordering on witchcraft, and an established record of producing lean and effective systems. SpaceX should be taken quite seriously when they undertake a technical challenge, but being taken seriously is different than being taken literally. And that becomes even more true when you consider that SpaceX is not a monolith and Elon is not personally running around with a cape making individual design decisions, meaning that while Elon owns the company, he's not the whole company. Some time ago, he also speculated about an operating cost for Super Heavy of a million dollars per launch. Okay, that may be attainable from a design perspective, but we're not going to see it in until at least a very mature configuration, something similar to the Block 5 equivalent of Starship, and it might only happen on the very last launch before Super Heavy is retired in some distant future. Point being, it's possible, sure but that doesn't mean it's going to be routine or a fair description of what typical launches are like over the course of the entirety of Super Heavy's service life. The same thing is probably true for a one hour relaunch. It might happen at some point, but that doesn't mean that it's normal. A Super Heavy relaunch the same day is still a massive change in orbital access, and that alone is worth it. Of course, there's another possibility to consider. Relaunch within one hour might be completely practical from the tower's point of view, not the boosters. If the countdown in launch operating procedures can be optimized, along with high reliability in the ground support equipment, the timeline discussed earlier does favor rolling another Super Heavy to the pad, stacking it with Mexilla, and launching around an hour after the previous one. That seems much more obtainable than relaunching the same booster in less than five or six hours. Of course, that's part of the narrative that frequently gets missed in its entirety. The revolution isn't the ship, 
it's the shipyard. Elon tweeted in 2021 that a high production rate cures many ills. He got a shipyard that can produce a super heavy lift rocket in a period of time conveniently measured in months. And if that production output is generally reusable, then SpaceX can have a fleet of them lined up for launches and maybe get up to launching one every three or four hours. Even if it takes a week for a single super heavy to get turned around for its next flight, at that launch cadence, what does it matter? So why the hell are we grading success by Elon's notoriously unreliable tweets anyway? We should be comparing it to the launch need and the capability to deliver rather than the design goal fantasies that it took to get there. Starship is going to be a simply breathtaking launch potential, but it remains to be seen if there will be a market demand for that sort of launch cadence, let alone one that would need them to relaunch in one hour. Five Starship launches a year can lift 100% of the global output of the satellite market, including Starlink. And SpaceX can build enough tankers to do refilling for Mars or lunar transfer launching twice a day for a week. So where does relaunching in an hour fit to this? And honestly, I don't think I could have wrapped up that argument any better. So that's where we're going to leave it. I'd like to thank my team members for their generous contribution to this video, for making such a strong case and for pointing out exactly what makes Starship special and what is completely unrealistic and irrelevant. Thanks again for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon and PayPal. All the details in the description. And until next time, stay angry about space.